Welcome. Cornell. It's Dale, my Dale pleasure to welcome you to this special seminar and to introduce Dr. Max Rothschild from Iowa State University. Max is Curtis Distinguished Professor of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the Ensminger uh, uh, Chair in International Animal Agriculture at Iowa State. Max has had broad impact in his teaching and research programs over many years, uh, mostly in the area of um, animal breeding and molecular genetics. Uh, that impact is reflected in over 350 peer review publications, 12 US patents. Max has two uh, R&D 100 awards, and in 2002, he was named Iowa Inventor of the Year. Uh, he's a triple AS fellow. Um, he's also had um, many impacts and continues to have many impacts in international programs. He's part of a program that's associated with the Center for uh, Sustainable Rural Livelihoods um, and a program that's working in Uganda to help families learn livestock practices. Uh, he was a Jefferson Fellow in 2011 and 2012 with the U.S. State Department working with USAID. In fact, he was a contemporary as a Jeff Jefferson Fellow with our own Kurt Weller. They um, served in those roles at the same time. Max is co-director of the Consortium for Global Food Security, which is centered at Iowa State University. I've known Max for a lot of years and have benefited from collaborations with him uh, in research, from working with him as a colleague in various leadership roles. And early on in my career, I benefited from his expertise as a teacher. Uh, so it's indeed my pleasure to welcome Max to the University of Nebraska and to present, for him to present his seminar on the role of livestock research in reducing food insecurity. Max, welcome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, after such a nice introduction, I'm not sure I can even come close to <coughs> what you've uh, set up for me, Archie, but I, I, I very much appreciate it. And I want to uh, tell everyone thank you for coming. One o'clock is not a great time to show up on a Friday for seminar, but I appreciate it. I, I in particular appreciate some of my, seeing some of my old friends and my mentors uh, uh, are here today, so hopefully I'll have something that's worth listening to. Um, I'm going to see. We we'll get this to work. I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem of food insecurity today, and I'm going to talk about how I got from my work as a genetics uh, person, a genetics student, in genomics, uh, some of the my interests in the developing world, and then finally I'll talk a little bit about at least geno genomics research as it relates to. Uh, uh, development, and then finally end up with some challenges and some opportunities. I see a lot of students here and, and young people, and I think there's some amazing opportunities that are available right now in the developing world. So I want to remind people of what the problem is. You know, we live in the heartland here, and in the heartland, whether it's Nebraska or Iowa or somewhere nearby, we, we think that there's plenty of food. But in fact, there's lots of food insecurity even in the, in the U.S. Uh, but if you look worldwide, there's somewhere between uh, 850 million and a billion people that, are, that suffer from chronic hunger. And that's a problem that affects all of us. We don't, we don't really see that, but it affects all of us. In particular, about 3.5 million children die yearly from, from issues related to uh, undernutrition. If we think about hunger, and we think about it in a broader sense, it undermines everything that happens in the world. It undermines our fight against disease like HIV or malaria. It undermines uh, countries of their human potential. And that's extremely important because that potential really uh, creates a world in which people are happy, they're safe, and they live in stable political environments. And so hunger can lead to misuse of natural resources and it can, it, it can really fuel social conflict and political instability. And we're seeing some of, that, some of that now worldwide. Now, I know this is a red state, so I apologize for bringing Hillary Clinton into it. 
But actually, Hillary was our boss when Clint and I were, uh, 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 Kurt and I were in, uh, uh, in D.C. And I, I, I admire uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton for her activities uh, related to issues related to uh, food insecurity. And she pointed out that the question is not whether we can end hunger, because I'm convinced we can do that as she is. It's whether we have the political will to get it done. And I think that's, I think that's pretty important. If you look at the global challenge, and you hear people bat these numbers around all the time, uh, but the trouble is, is the numbers just keep getting worse. By 2050, and I'm not sure I'll be around by 2050, but the world in which my children will live in and many of, uh, of their friends will live in, by 2050, there'll be about 9.6 billion people. Now, just two years ago, we thought that number was 9 billion. Now we've upped it to 9.6 billion. And if we look at that, most of those people will be the increases in population will come in the developing world. And of course, that's where most of the hunger is already concentrated. So that's problematic. If you look at what FAO says, they say we need to increase food production by about 70%. That's the minimum. But some of the other estimates are even more dire in terms of that. If we're going to uh, create a food, uh, food stability and food security worldwide. So we have to do that with all kinds of issues related to sustainability and climate change is certainly one of the big areas that <clears throat> that uh, we talk a lot about so it doesn't really matter to me whether you believe this is man-made or not there are lots of people in the world who say well it's not man-made it's not my problem it doesn't really matter climate change is here and by climate change we mean more droughts more excessive uh, uh, weather conditions climate change is here and it's going to create problems for livestock producers for people that grow crops and produce food. Uh, there are other constraints. There's only so much land that's available. This is the first time I've come to Lincoln in a while and, uh, and uh, Dr. Clutter uh, showed me around a little bit and I was amazed at how much uh, 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 Lincoln is spread out. It's taking farmland away. And, that's, and this is an area where we do a great job of producing food so we're not so concerned about it. But if you think about urban sprawl and you think about people building homes and places in, in areas in which there's only so much good land, that's problematic. So land is, is a fixed uh, resource. Uh, water, energy, labor, fertilizer, those are all concerns that we, we have to have. So we, we also need some system diversification if we're going to improve diets and uh, enhance nutrition and incomes. So there's enormous sustainability challenges that face us if we're going to produce more food. And if you think about this in the livestock sector, and if you think about it from a negative point of view, which many of our critics already think that in that direction, then they complain that we're just degrading things, we're, we're causing uh, greenhouse gases, but we have, to, we have to move towards carbon uh, sequestration. We have to move away from uh, overgrazing land to making a sustainable management, and we have to move away from pollution and, uh, to, to using the, the uh, manure for fertilizer, biogas, and producing clean water. So There's a very interesting article in Science this week about uh, swine units in China polluting uh, everything, which if you've ever been to China, you know that. But now the big concern is uh, antibiotic use, which is rampant in China compared to how it's used on farms here in the US. Now, what's driving all of this? And what's driving it is the so-called livestock revolution. I'm a livestock person, so I'm going to talk about this from, from that uh, standpoint today. But the livestock revolution is being driven by the fact that people want more meat. And it's not just more meat, they want more animal source foods, meat, milk, eggs. And, the, and as incomes go up in, many of the develop, in much of the developing world, the demand gets much higher. So most of these, if you think about many of these developing countries, the average wage is somewhere in the neighborhood of one to three dollars a day. The, the economists tell us that the demand for animal source foods will increase until people reach an income, a yearly income of about ten thousand dollars a year. So that's an enormous increase. And if you look in some parts of the world, like some parts of the world, like uh, uh, Africa, they're going to more than double meat consumption. You look at Latin America you'll have about a 50% increase in, in parts of Asia. So we're going to need to produce of that. Now, some of our critics say, well, listen, 
that, that could happen in the developing world and we'll just eat a little less meat here in, in, in North America and parts of Latin America and parts of Europe. And that's true, we could certainly eat less uh, animal source foods. It probably wouldn't hurt us from a health standpoint. But the point is that's not even gonna make a dent in the demand that's out there and it's not gonna make a d dent from what the economists tell us in some of the projections for the future. So uh, Dr. Clutter did a nice job of saying something about who I am. I was trained as a quantitative uh, geneticist. Actually, uh, <coughs> my co-major professor is here, Dr. Dale Van Vleck. And uh, <coughs> I have to say, I haven't been this nervous for some time, uh, Dale, about giving a talk. <coughs> Uh, if I'd known you were coming, I might have backed out at the last moment. Uh, but I was trained as a quantitative geneticist. I worked in those days when I worked in, in, with Dale and, and, and C.R. Henderson. I worked with cattle, and then I came to Iowa State and worked with pigs. And a number of people here in the room were my colleagues in, in the old NC projects that did the work with pig, pig genetics. And then I slowly moved over into gene mapping and gene identification and some, some genomics work. And in more recent years, uh, I've tried to take some of the work that we've done and, and implement that into livestock production systems. So I, I don't know how many people here are geneticists, but I always feel like I have to come back to my roots every once in a while. And I want to remind people that the livestock uh, 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 genetic and genomic revolution is a relatively young thing. Domestication of livestock took part, for the most part, 10,000 years ago. Breeds were developed about 350 years ago, and modern animal breeding started somewhere in the neighborhood of about 75 years ago. And I'm an old guy, and I started right there uh, with genetic evaluations. So I'm relatively, I, I've, I've been around for the last uh, uh, almost 40 years working in animal breeding and, and genetics. And <clears throat> we, we've made incredible uh, changes in things. If you look here, and I've, I've, I've taken the liberty of, of some pictures to show some of the young people where we've where we've come from here. But if you look at, this is a, a picture of how chickens have changed through animal breeding here. So these are 19 uh, birds from 1957 controls compared to 2001 selected broilers. And if you look at the different uh, ages of the, of the birds, you can see that we went from a scrawny little bird at 43 days to a remarkably uh, robust uh, chicken. Uh, and if you take them out to 85 days, it's amazing how fast these birds grow and, and how much meat they put on. And this was all done essentially by quantitative genetics. If you look at dairy production, enormous increases in dairy production in the developed world. Uh, and this has come about primarily through genetics, but also improved feeding, improved reproduction, improved use of, of, of uh, superior management techniques. So it's amazing that we can, we can produce the food we need in the developed world. And the old saying is that if you Think of uh, this so-called American breakfast there on the left. I'm not sure how many people ate one of those today. Uh, <clears throat> it's a few more calories than most of us need. But in any case, uh, in 1950, that took about 15,000 acres to produce. Now it takes less than 5,000 acres. So at least in the developed world, we're moving in the right direction of producing the food we need and in, in using less resources to do that in a reasonably sustainable manner. So why is the success? And that's what I, I, I teach a course in international animal science and I ask all the undergraduates that take my class, why did we, how did we do that? How do we produce those chickens that grew much faster and how do we produce those pigs and cows that do much better? And most people say it's the genetics or it's the management. And the truth of the matter is the very first thing we did was produce, provide unlimited feed and water resources for our livestock. Now you think to yourself, well that's a no brainer, everyone would do that. But in most of the world, that's absolutely impossible to do for small holders. There are one billion people in the world that are considered small holders and that raise livestock. In many cases, one, two, three large animals, 10 or 12 chickens, but they don't have the ability to give unlimited feed and water resources and therefore production is limited. We can talk about improved health and management, sophisticated animal genetics, uh, genetic potential can then be, be realized. But the starting point is providing uh, these small holders with the ability to provide their livestock with feed and water. Now a lot's happened, uh, as, uh, as Archie said and, and as I've said, 
Uh, I came from quantitative genetics and I somehow got lost along the way and I got interested in molecular genetics. And in, in my group, we've, we've, had the, we've been lucky enough to, to find a few things that have been useful in the swine industry. We were able to find <coughs> a mutation in the estrogen receptor gene that affected litter size in pigs. We've worked on genes associated with feed intake, a gene called MC4R, which is a, is a receptor in the brain that is an appetite receptor. And <coughs> we were lucky enough to do uh, some work to show how to improve feed efficiency in the pig. And, and then more recently, uh, one of your colleagues, Dan uh, Chibano, when he was a postdoc in my lab, uh, showed that we could improve the quality of, of, of pork, uh, both in appearance and tenderness, uh, through uh, discovery of two genes, PRK gamma-3 and CAST. So using molecular genetics uh, and the right systems, we we're able to not only improve production levels, but also uh, improve the quality of the products that people uh, eat. And more recently, we've been, <coughs> everyone in the, in the livestock industry has been uh, involved in helping to sequence all the major uh, species. And finally, the pig was, uh, was uh, <coughs> sequenced here just a couple of years ago. So we have the sequence, or at least a draft sequence, on, on all these uh, different species. And this sequencing is being commoditized. And by that, I mean it used to cost $3 billion to obtain a sequence. You can probably resequence an animal now for less than $1,000. And someday soon, we'll be sequencing brand new uh, de novo sequences for probably $10,000 or less. So with this information, we can determine all types of genetic disorders. We can look for genes associated with quantitative traits, which kind of got me back to what I was interested in at the first. Uh, when I was working with Dale as a, as a graduate student. Uh, and so we've made remarkable gains. But what's happened, and we haven't reached this point yet that we can barcode our animals and just determine what their values are, but what's happened is that this is only for the developed world. And <clears throat> because it's only for the developed world and only for large animal systems, it does not really affect most of the world who raises livestock, most of the world who eats animal source uh, uh, foods. And, and if we're gonna change the world and provide more food, we need to address those people. In many parts of the world, animals are crucial to economic survival. And in particular, that's true of women farmers. Many women are in charge, in most of the poor countries, are in charge of livestock. They raise them. They're responsible for watering them, their care, and if they're lucky enough, they derive some income from them. There's, that, that's an issue related to gender on, on, on these farms. Animal uh, source foods provide critically needed micronutrients. Uh, animals serve as the economic bank. If you think back to how animals were used in this country in the 1850s, animals were an economic bank. If somebody needed money, they sold a, a, a livestock to, to, to provide their family with money. That's still the case in much of the world. And animals in most countries provide about 50% of the gross domestic product in these underdeveloped uh, 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 countries. Well, I got interested in the developing world about 10 years ago. And part of this came about from, I guess, in all honesty, a bit of dissatisfaction with what I was doing. I had no doubts that the genomic work that myself and my students and my colleagues were working on was important but it was basically changing <coughs> food production uh, in a country in which we could afford everything we, we paid for, for the most part. And <coughs> we might be lowering the price of pork a dime, 20 cents, 50 cents, whatever, but I didn't see us as feeding the world that way. And I thought back to at least why I got involved in animal science uh, almost 50 years ago, and that was to, to see, to at least play some role in how to feed people. And so I started thinking about that. And at the time, it was, a, it was just a chance meeting. I had a meeting with my dean, and she was talking about uh, uh, actually a new project that a donor wanted us to start in Uganda. And the project was going to have, they're going to drill uh, uh, wells for water. They were going to teach students. They were going to grow crops. And I said, well, hey, <coughs> where's the livestock in this deal? And, and uh, uh, my dean, Kathy Wotecki, who's now assistant uh, uh, she's the chief scientist for USDA. She said, well, if you want livestock, you're going to be in charge of it. So I jumped in like I often do 
with little knowledge in both feet. And I said, well, I'll go to Uganda and I'll learn about this. And so I became a member of what's called the Center for Sustainable Rural Livelihoods. And I began a low scale livestock project. And uh, there's been three, essentially three phases of the project. The first was to work with a local NGO called Vedco. And we just gave out pigs and chickens and goats to people. And we, <clears throat> we did it very much like the Heifer International model. You get two pigs, after they have a few offspring, you share those with your neighbor. And uh, we started primarily with pigs. Pigs were a good uh, a, a source of income in Uganda. The problem is, is they eat a lot of food that humans would eat. And so they're, they're competitors. Goats, uh, not so much so. Chickens, not so much so. The program was developed uh, by the generous donation of one uh, donor and his family. And we've, we've been working ever since. And so we helped cost share buildings and startups. We advised primarily women farmers in how to do livestock production. And here I am, uh, one of my visits, helping build a shelter for somebody using a, using a, a pick to try and break up the rock before, to make the, the flooring in this rather crude, what we used to call open fronted buildings in the old days. And that's a pretty typical structure uh, in Uganda for a small scale farmer. Uh, this, is what the, this is what good pigs look like in Uganda. Here they are in the structure. They're eating uh, just some leftover greens that, uh, that have been either uh, cut or picked uh, from some of the food that people eat. Um, here's a picture of some goats. They're not as lucky. They're just eating some leaves off some branches. So feeding livestock is an enormous problem. And this, <clears throat> this really relates to my earlier comment. Unlimited feed and water really are important in almost all livestock production. The second phase of the project, we were lucky enough to get a large uh, grant from the Monsanto Fund. And I know Monsanto often has a black eye from a lot of people, but they have a very nice uh, charity called the Monsanto Fund, which supports uh, production of both crops and livestock around the world and helps in some very good charitable activity. And they funded a project and we started with 100 farmers. We engaged them in livestock activity uh, and as an income generating activity. We put more emphasis on goats and chickens. And then I moved into the schools and started working with young people, teaching them how to do poultry production. So many of these schools, we, we created a small a flock and then uh, collected eggs to improve their lunchtime nutrition and also to teach them about poultry production. Here's a, a picture of one of the, the uh, small uh, poultry houses. Here we are <clears throat> just with the young birds, uh, making sure they're well fed and, and, and medicated. Now, the other thing that we've done is we've tried to uh, take some of the technologies that have moved into the developing world and we've tried to make them more useful for people. So one of the things that amazed me, I learned a lot in the developing countries about what would and wouldn't work. But nearly everyone has a cell phone. <clears throat> and even if they can't afford almost anything else, they have cell phones for communications. And at least in the crop area now, they're starting to use those uh, effectively to try and uh, get uh, prices and, and, and reports on how to sell, sell crops. One of the things that we found often in the villages is that, especially women farmers, were at the mercy of the traders who came by to buy their products. So if you raised a pig and you decided today was the day to sell it, you don't have a car, you don't have a truck, you don't have a motorbike to get that pig to market. But a trader will come by and he'll say, I'll, I'll buy that pig and it's only 40 kilos. And the pig might be 50 kilos. So one of the things we developed was we developed some equations to predict, uh, to predict the weights of pigs from uh, uh, length and, and height and uh, heart girth measurements, nothing new about that. That's been done for years here in the US. But we also developed an app for that so that it can be placed on a phone. Now, most of the people in these countries don't have smartphones yet. No, no argument about that. But <clears throat> some of the workers that we work with in the NGOs do. And so we've made this available now so people can tell farmers what the weights of their pigs are with some quick measurements. Uh, since there's no scales available for that. So the idea here is, again, to move technology into, useful hand, into, into a useful space for people to, to use. Our final part of our project has been to look at nutrition. And <clears throat> no matter what you do, especially in, in Africa, you see lots of people that are incredibly undernourished. 
And this affects mostly young women and their children. So there are a lot of times uh, uh, having children at very young ages. The children, uh, the, there's, no, there's no pregnancy, there's no uh, uh, prenatal care that's taken. And so the babies are born underweight and they starve, uh, they starve. And so we've been starting to work uh, as part of our, our centers. We've set up eight different nutrition centers in our area and we're helping uh, 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 feed women and teaching them how to use and feed, uh, how to feed their children. But we're also supplying them with chickens. And the idea here is that we're teaching them a trade, how to raise chickens for egg production. They're using some of the eggs for nutrition of their family, and they're using some of the eggs to sell uh, to produce income for, for, uh, for their families. Our project now, after uh, about 10 years and starting pretty small in the livestock area, we've been helping about 5,000 uh, people right now. And we're right in the phase that we're gonna start to, to try and <coughs> really scale that up in a much larger position. So what this project really got me thinking about was What's the source? How am I going to help people in developing countries? And what was pretty clear to me was that I couldn't use most of what I learned in the developed world. I had to start from scratch. I had to use activities related to more food and more water for livestock and better care for them. Well, just about that time, uh, I saw an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and work with USAID. Uh, this was an incredible opportunity. Uh, Kurt uh, Weller uh, also took advantage of that. Uh, it's called the Jefferson Science Fellowship, and <clears throat> I would encourage faculty to consider this. It's a great opportunity. Your university has to participate because uh, <clears throat> they have to pay, continue to pay your salary, but you're basically going to Washington to work with the State Department or with USAID, and the purpose of that, frankly, is to teach uh, those people about science and the role of science in policy development. And so <clears throat> I worked at uh, USAID, which is the uh, lead agency for Feed the Future. That's the US government's uh, program to, to end global hunger. I worked in the research area, and what this allowed me to do is actually go back to some of the research I had been interested in for most of my career, combine that with some of my development interest, and try to see if there was, a <coughs> there was some intersection of this work so that I could work, uh, work in that space. And so when I came, when I was at USAID, one of the things I did with both crops and livestock was to ask, what role does genetics play and genomics play in developing countries? And so <coughs> one of the things that I've been interested in then is really asking the question, how do I use some of these very uh, modern molecular techniques and use those in developing countries to produce results. So <clears throat> we've started to look at what animals or breeds might, we might sequence to learn something about livestock production. In particular, we're looking for animals that are resilient to the climate, resilient to the natural uh, disease challenges that are there. We're also interested <clears throat> in looking at parallel investments in phenotypic data. If you look at the U.S. right now, most of the money that's being used in the genomic sphere is to collect the right phenotypes. The, the, by phenotypes, I mean the traits, growth data, meat quality data, <coughs> disease resistance data, all of these traits that are expensive, that's where the expense is. The cost for genotyping has just gone down remarkably so. And in the developed world, it's even, in the developing world, it's even more problematic because you don't have standard conditions to kit collect those phenotypic records. We also need to ask what kind of bioinformatic tools are available to, to people in developing world? What about data storage? Is there any institutional capacity? <clears throat> One of the things that happened in the late 60s and early 70s, the Rockefeller Foundation invested incredible monies in Latin America and Africa in capacity building. They helped build up institutions. They helped train people here in the U.S. And since then, hardly any money has been spent in that. And so if you go to a lot of these institutions, what must have been palaces in those days are now in, in disrepair. I was in Peru uh, at La Molina uh, University in Lima. <clears throat> Beautiful institution. It was built all on Rockefeller dollars. 
hasn't had any new influx of money in some years, and it's suffering. So what we need to really ask ourselves is, if we're going to give people the ability to feed themselves, then we're going to have to train them. And they need to train themselves not only here in this country, but we need to train them in their own institutions so they stay in their countries and help build those up. We don't need additional people to come here. We need to help people, uh, train people so they help their own countries. And in this regard, how are we going to help in terms of human capacity? And these are some things I've been thinking about and trying to work uh, in, at Iowa State on. Now, one of the examples is I can use genomics to look at genetic backgrounds of different livestock. Well, why would I want to do that? Well, <clears throat> just as looking in Chinese pigs helped me to understand something about uh, reproduction in U.S. pigs, we start to look at some of these uh, breeds and populations in the develop, uh, developing world that have been naturally selected for resilience to drought or resilience to heat stress. These will provide some clues for us of how we might want to change our own livestock as the climate changes. And this is just a, a, a way of looking at different genetic differences among not only uh, uh, European breeds, but also uh, Zebu breeds and some, and some animals from, uh, from Kenya right here. So these were actually uh, uh, cattle from uh, large dairies. These were, ca uh, I'm sorry, large dairies, and these were cattle from small dair dairies uh, in Kenya. And what this showed here is that at least, uh, something very interesting, in large dairies, where people provide enough care, Holsteins are useful. In small dairies, one or two cows, the, the, those, those, aren't, those are disasters waiting to happen. They don't have the care, veterinary care, they don't have the water. You know, this water thing, I never really realized, but if you work where I work in Uganda, and all the water comes from wells, there's virtually no catchment systems. <clears throat> if you don't haul that water each day, that animal doesn't survive, doesn't grow, doesn't produce milk, you still got to put a lot of water through a cow to get milk. So these are all problems. So we've been looking at ways to uh, at least genetically describe these different breeds to figure out what's going on. And you can talk about very sophisticated methods. Some of my colleagues are talking about using extremely sophisticated genomic selection, marker-assisted selection, uh, perhaps RNAi. That's being done in plants now in some of the developing world to, to fight some of the new viruses. But those are difficult and complex solutions for problems that we really don't understand yet in the developed world. There's, there's a fair amount of money out there, but it's hard to come by for research. And one of the things that frustrates uh, researchers in this country, uh, faculty members of course, are to get grants. The same thing exists in the developing world. How do you get funding that you need to do the work? Um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a possibility, though that's a difficult sell for most people. Uh, USAID, the CG uh, research centers are also uh, places to consider. But if we're going to achieve genetic gain in developing countries, and that's where most of my research is, it's pretty tough to do. We've got to take into account realities, and this is something I keep reminding people, is you can't think that because you're in the developed world you have all the solutions. You have few of the solutions until, you have, until you've learned a lot more of what goes on. And what really is true is <clears throat> it's not only environment and climate and, and uh, feed and water availability, but infrastructure, institutions, these are all limiting factors. One of the projects that I have been working on with USAID uh, is the GOAT project. It's the Norman Borlaug Commemorative Research Initiative on the GOAT Genome. And <clears throat> Like most projects from USAID, they're all labeled with, with Norman Borlaug's name. Uh, it's kind of an interesting approach to things. But the GOAT project is uh, asked the question, really, what can we do uh, to improve goats worldwide? Uh, as most of you may know, small ruminants are extremely important in the developing world. They have low maintenance. <clears throat> they're generally pretty hardy if they're breeds that are locally developed. And so we've been trying to, uh, we, we have money invested from the U.S. government to look and develop tools and reagents uh, from goats around the world, try and collect the DNA from those breeds, and then try and understand what makes those breeds resilient uh, and hardy. And so the idea here, again, is to try and determine what makes them productive in these limited environments, but then look for ways to enhance that productivity 
using uh, uh, breeds from, from the developed world. And so sampling is going on all around uh, Africa in particular. Uh, my project, I've been working with an Egyptian in the last couple of years, and we've been selecting uh, goats and sheep from uh, a lot of uh, very hot and dry areas. I have a real interest in heat stress and trying to understand the genetic control of heat stress. And the reason for that's very simple. In the Midwest, as an example, Nebraska is a great example, as, as Iowa, there are a lot of livestock losses due to heat stress. Now, we have the benefit here in the Midwest, we can build shelters, we can provide shade. For uh, pigs and chickens, we can have cooling system, evaporative systems. But in most of the world, they don't have the money to build shelters and the animals have been just naturally selected to withstand that heat, that heat stress. So we're looking actually at genes associated with heat stress. We're using breeds all over uh, uh, Africa, but in particular, my group is looking at breeds from, uh, from Egypt. And what we're looking at is trying to understand whether we can look at what's called signatures of selection. We're using a goat called a barky goat in particular here, and we're looking for uh, here in the, in the first panel of the Manhattan plot that's up there, we're looking for associations with, with heat tolerance, and there's one on, on chromosome two. And then we divided our, our uh, goats into uh, highly tolerant ones. These are ones that were stressed, and we took temperature measurements from, and we have ones that are lower uh, tolerant. And here's a signature selection that has nothing to do with heat because they're in both the, the uh, highly tolerant ones and the lowly tolerant ones. But here's another signature selection that we see on chromosome uh, uh, fifth, uh, 15 that's associated with, with, probably associated with heat tolerance. We've also looked at sheep in the region, and what's really interesting is, you know, something about genomics. Uh, sheep and goats and cows all have about the same uh, uh, chromosomal arrangements, and we found signatures of selection in both sheep and goats from the same region in the same chromosomal region. So there's something in that region that's helped to naturally select animals for, for, for heat tolerance or for some local disease. Now, <clears throat> again, it's a problem that I think we have in the developed world. We think we can provide all the solutions and we can use fancy genomic techniques or fancy research techniques to do that. But the truth of the matter is, how do I get from that point to this point? This is a group of Kenyan women that have some uh, dairy cows, uh, dairy goats, and those goats were provided through a local NGO. And the project is totally unsustainable. It's, gonna, it's, it's essentially in the process of failing because they'd worked out some essentially Ponzi scheme that the women would get paid for this or that, and, nobody, and as soon as one person quit paying, the system failed. So our question was, how do we improve these goats and make it sustainable? So, how do we move genomic approaches to finding the right genes or selecting the right sires to African goats? And how does this eventually get value added for these, these poor people? And this is an enormous challenge. And I'm, I'm here to say that after 10 years of working in Africa, I'm still learning about it. It's a challenge, but it's something, especially for young people, it's a challenge that I think we need, need to pick up. One of the areas that I've been incredibly impressed upon, uh, 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 incredibly pleased about is to see the private-public partnerships. Uh, uh, Kurt worked in this area when he was in DC uh, and, and I did a little bit, but groups like Illumina and then your local company here, Neogen or, or GeneSeq, the, the actual company that's in the region, have been extremely good about helping to, to uh, provide discounts for work, research that's done in developing countries. And those private-public partnerships are going to be extremely useful in developing new products and helping to improve the, the landscape and the livestock that are, that are involved. My colleagues and I are also working on a project now uh, looking at climate change uh, in chickens. And this is actually a USDA project. We've been looking at heat stress and trying to understand, again, the genomics of heat stress. The losses to poultry in the last uh, few summers have been really hot summers, have been rather amazing, They're extremely uh, 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 challenged by heat, and it's a very costly loss, not only here in the U.S., but around the world. And so what we've been doing at Iowa State is we've been looking at broilers uh, from a uh, commercial line. <coughs> Our former colleague Arnie Nordskog imported Fayumi chickens from Egypt 50-some years ago, and 
I'm sure he never thought that it would come to this, but we have been using these Fayumis uh, to try and understand heat stress. And so we've created the broilers, the Fayumis, and now we have uh, uh, a F18 uh, inbred, uh, uh, F18 cross. We've been interse mating them for years, and we're also sampling birds from, from around the world. And what we're doing in this study is we're preheating not only the, the chickens, but also eggs. We're looking for, <coughs> we're looking for uh, genomic differences, epigenetic differences, and we're looking at the transcriptomics uh, related to the heat stress work. Very, very interesting. What's, what you see here, and this, this, uh, this thermal imagery kind of tells part of the story of why we should be interested in this and why we should look at animals in their native environments in these developed countries. If you look here at the room temperature one, the little bird there on the left that's all red and the hot color, if you like, that's the Fayumi. And the, the, the middle one size one is the, is the crossbred, and the largest bird is the broiler. <clears throat> now, you up the temperature to 35 degrees centigrade, which is hot, and what do you see? Well, the Fayumi really doesn't change its heat pattern very much at all. And the other birds have really heated up. And they're struggling. And if you actually, if I had a, a video, what you'd see is the, 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 the crossbred and the broiler would be laying in the wood chips, panting away, trying to, not moving at all. And this Fayumi is jumping around, jumping over all of them. Uh, just basically having a good old time as if he was a day at the beach. So what we're really trying to understand is, what are those heat stress genes? How are they involved? Can we not only use them to improve our own birds as climate change, but also so we could identify those genes as we do crosses back into those lines to improve productivity in the developing world. Uh, here's a Sulamont student, Angelica, and she's looking at a chicken here that I'm holding. We, we, uh, one of the things I've tried to do is take some of our students to Uganda, and here we are sampling birds from Uganda. Well, what are the roadblocks? Well, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of them, and, and that's why we need more people to take up the cause to do uh, the research and the training and the, act and the development activities. It's difficult to, to discover real gene effects for heat and stress tolerance and disease resistance. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I've been looking at disease resistance projects now uh, since early in my career. We haven't gotten very far. There's a lot of hard work. Uh, Roger's smiling. He and I had discussions about that. Oh, I'm just going to say 30 years ago, right, Roger? Uh, and <clears throat> we, you know, there's a real desire to maintain those local breeds. We can't come in and solve everything with a Holstein model where big production solves everything. We've got to use local breeds. We have to understand how to improve those local breeds uh, so, that <clears throat> so that we uh, keep with animals that the, small that the small holder wants. We, we also need to reduce the yield gap by not only genetics research, but I'm sure there's others of you here that are doing nutrition work, doing management, physiology. There's enormous opportunities out there in the developed world. We've got to get delivery systems. Even if we found the right uh, chicken or the right cow or the right goat, how are we going to deliver those in systems that have no infrastructure? And we need to provide good science and capacity building opportunities for our students to learn how to work in those countries and for their students to work in their countries, learn in their countries, and stay there and help, help, help those people. And as I said, this is, applies to all animal science research, not just animal genetics. If I was to give you a take-home message, uh, applying genomics to livestock in the developing world is challenging at every level. And I want to contrast that with if you want to make genetic improvement in any livestock species in the developed world, we know how to do it. And we can do it for nearly every trait. But that's not true in the developing world. So the real challenge out there is to apply <coughs> some of the science and some of the, some of the science and some of the development work to improve uh, livestock production. <coughs> we need to increase production and survivability. We need to re raise animals that, are, that won't succumb to heat stress, have better health, and are what we might call climate resilient. And these are all critical for food production and for worldwide food security. We can't let someone else worry about it. Our lives are threatened by political instability caused in many parts of the world because people are hungry. 
There's lots of other issues. I won't, you know, political, religious, etc. But a lot of that root is just flat out people are hungry in different parts of the world. Now, at Iowa State, one of the things that we've tried to do in the last couple of years is to ask the question, how can we get teams of people together to create better research that applies more globally? And so we've created a global food security uh, consortium. What, what, lots of places have them now. They have centers. But what I think separates ours from most of them is we do both crops and livestock and water. And we've tried to combine those. And we've done that, frankly, through uh, working with our friends here at Nebraska to bring in the, the water component. There's no doubt at Iowa State we've got some outstanding people in the crop sciences and the animal sciences. We didn't have that component in water. Uh, the group here from Nebraska is working with us to develop that consortium. And we've got other groups from around the world. We've got a number of different uh, uh, CG centers. We've got people from other institutions. And again, our role here is to bring people together to talk about research that will be useful in the developing world to reduce food insecurity. Uh, our, our platforms are fairly straightforward. We're looking at seed systems, crop systems, healthy animals, water systems, post-harvest utilization. I haven't talked about that, but that's a big area. You know, the figures are that we waste between 25 and 35 percent of our food. I, in, my, in my undergraduate class, I asked students to keep a log. And at the end of one month, most of them are incredibly surprised at how much money they threw away during the, the month by wasted food. <coughs> And, of course, the other area is policy and regulations. We're trying to combine that with issues related to social change, entrepreneurship, and technology. And I'd like to invite all of you. We're having a conference April 14th and 15th uh, in Ames at the Gateway Center. You can go to our website. We hope some of you will come and, and listen to some of the speakers out there. Well, I think we're going to have a real interesting conference uh, here in April. In terms of animal source food, some of the projects we're working on, we're looking at improving meat and milk. <clears throat> I'm working on a project to increase vitamin A content in milk. Well, really, uh, 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 to look at the precursors of vitamin A in milk. We're looking at ways to increase iron in fish and, and, and meat products, and of course, decrease levels of, of fat. And this is all by non-GMO. You know, many of our colleagues in the plant world have approached this from, from a GMO, GMO standpoint. You can get a lot more vitamin A by orange flesh potatoes or golden rice. We can do it naturally by selecting the right, uh, right components in, in some of our other products. We don't need GMOs to do that. And that's not my, I'm not being negative on GMOs. I'm just re looking at the fact that much of the public is worried about GMOs. Well, we're working on with teams to produce new proposals. Uh, we're looking at increasing the number of institutions that we work with. And of course, uh, Part of my goal to come here today was to talk to people and see if there are ways that we could collaborate on some new projects. If you need a take home message, uh, we need other breakthroughs. We need people to work on policies. I never thought I'd ever say we need one more economist in the world, but we do. We need people to work on policy. We need to look at policies that support livestock research in the developing world and also the developed world. You know, if you look at what's happening in this country, only about 20% of the money that USAID uses, for instance, for life, is for livestock. USDA's um, uh, amount of investment in livestock is much smaller than some of its other areas. There's not enough done on policy to, prevent why, to, to promote wise use of livestock production in different, different parts of the country. We need to have support for smallholders around the world, a billion livestock keepers. Those people, it's a crucial that they learn how to produce animals uh, more effectively, produce more animal source foods, and do it in a more healthy manner. A lot of zoonotic diseases out there. We need to work with private, public, uh, private and public partnerships to deliver the systems. <clears throat> and most importantly, we need more interested young scientists and funding to do the work. And it's got to be sustainable. So we've got to think about these as sustainable solutions. So there's some enormous challenges out there. Um, I'm old enough, and a few people are in this room, to remember uh, that when the Russians launched the Sputnik uh, 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 satellite, uh, we, we went outside and we watched it. And my father was a chemist, uh, a, a good scientist. He was a chemist. And he took my brother and I outside, and he, we watched 
we watched Sputnik come up, came over, and he told us, I can still remember this to, uh, to the day, he said, you know, the biggest challenge is we're going to have to beat these guys into space. Well, we did beat the Russians into space. It was a major effort. The country got together and developed high, high science to do this. But I, I got news for you. The only challenge that we have now is to feed the world. And so my, my goal in the last few years of my career are to look at ways to not only contribute to that goal, but to try and convince young people and others, everyone in between, if you like, that it's important that we look at solutions. <clears throat> if you're here at the University of Nebraska, you're getting a great education. Now the question is, can you commit it to something that's going to make a difference? And that difference is feeding people. And I really hope uh, people can get excited about that. So I, I, I got a lot of people to thank over the years, people who have contributed to, to the, some of the research that I showed you, some of the funders, and of course, people at the Academy and, and USAID and, and Iowa State who've, who've supported some of the things I've talked about today. So <clears throat> this is a group of young uh, kids that I, that I was uh, visiting one of the farms one day, and they all came up to get their picture taken. This is what we need, lots of happier people that are, that are better fed. And these are actually some of the Ugandan kids that I, that I work with on a, on a somewhat regular basis. So I'd be happy to try and answer questions. It, I, I, I didn't tell you a lot of science today, but I hope I got you excited about wanting to do something to feed people and use the science that you know something about uh, in that process. So thanks very much.